Well, hello there and welcome. We have a special guest today in our video. It's uh, Professor Thordarsson from the University of Iceland who's here. He's a prominent volcanologist in Iceland and also author of my favorite book on Iceland, this one here that he wrote with a colleague. Um, great book with lots of uh, really accurate and great information about the geology. Um, so Professor Thordarsson, we're of course going to talk a little bit about the eruption and what's going on on the Reykjanes Peninsula and I thought maybe we'd step back when I was in graduate school many years ago there was a lot of talk about you know tectonism and volcanism and what's what's the driver in any given landscape that, that has those two forces operating so can you maybe walk us through a bit of what's happening in, in the Reykjanes area we know it's a divergent boundary and a hot spot but how are the tectonics the hot spot and that volcanism working in that area so the Reykjanes Peninsula is actually where the uh, uh, the Reykjanes Ridge or the sort of the, the segment of the Mid Atlantic Ridge, which is closest to Iceland, comes ashore, and and it's linking with all the other structures in Iceland, sort of across the peninsula. Right, and you get those n echelon systems going across the peninsula, correct? Yes, and and. Uh, it is not, you know, obvious what it is. It looks like it is a leaky transform. So mm -hmm. what we know is that the, the inferred plate boundaries seem to be sub parallel to the spreading direction across the Reykjanes Peninsula. Right. So, and but it's not quiet. So it, 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 there's an angle between the two. So a portion of the movement uh, uh, across the Reykjanes Peninsula is not just the plate sliding past each other, but it's also a little bit of an extension. Right. And that's, that's the reason for the volcanism. And probably the reason why we have the volcanism in Reykjanes Peninsula periodic. So we get these eruption periods which are three to four hundred years long. And then we have six hundred to thousand years of quiescent, no eruptions at all. Probably some earthquakes, but no eruptions. Right, but that's driven by the extension. The extension is causing the decompression melting in the mantle, and that's the source of the magma. Or do we have any hotspot component? The, well, across the Reykjavik Peninsula, we do have uh, 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 we seem to have a mixture of or both components from the from the the mantle plume, the fertile sort of magma source. Mm -hmm. And the, the also the depleted magma source of, of the, beneath the mid ocean ridges. Right. And uh, the, these most likely mix so, somehow in some proportion in the in the the source region beneath the Reykjanes Peninsula. And these magmas they accumulate into uh, what has been described as axial reservoirs, sort of at uh, somewhere between ten and fifteen kilometers depth. Right. So the hot. And, and Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, those actual reservoirs, they feed either eruptions directly in some cases, like you have in, in, in 21 in the Faradarfjall. Right. Or they feed a, a shallow storage zone, sort of four to six kilometers depth. Like it's like Svartsengi, yeah. Right. Now, right. And in Svartsengi and then feeding magma from there, when, when you pressurize that uh, storage zone, and and and, it, and the in, internal pressure exceeds the the tensile strength of the crust right. above. Then, then uh, the magma comes up. You basically sort of lift the lid. So the shallower reservoirs are almost like a, uh, uh, um, what be what what's the word I'm looking for? It, they're sills, right? They're these these shallow well, magma. They're, 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 yeah, we, we can call them sills or, or just irregular bodies. We don't right. really know. Yeah, what their geometries are. Sure. Uh, the, yeah. They're almost like uh, a. It's almost like a valve. Right. And so if I'm reading you right, the hotspot's location is further east, more like in central Iceland, beneath the Vatnajökull uh, ice cap. But there's it's there's some feeder pathways that are still, as it's dragging, well, there's some coming over into the Reykjanes area? The, the, the mantle plume center is thought to be uh, beneath uh, the western part of Vatnajökull. Okay. Um, Sometimes people move it around, uh, and it, it, how you define it, it it's, uh, it's an interesting sort of a right. Yeah, where it's uh, exactly uh, at is a bit yeah. yeah it, but, but it also has a dimension, and I have never heard anyone come up with a 
a good figure for the for the the dimension of the of the head of that mantle plume. Right, the area yeah. it would occupy in map view. Right. Yeah. Right. So it seems like it definitely has some component in the Reykjanes area, but then you add that to the extension at the boundary, and that's where the volcanism is. is that's why we see volcanism there. It's both components are Yeah, well, the together. reason why Iceland is a hot spot is because you have both the, you know, mid-ocean ridge-related magmatism. Right. And uh, superimposed on that, or, or <laughs> underneath that, you have the mantle plume coming in as an added component. So right. What we end up with is is much greater magma production in the Iceland area than than as a normal, you know, sort of mid ocean ridge plate boundary. Yeah, and that excess magmatism or excess volcanism uh, uh, is manifested as as Iceland, and and, uh, and that's why the uh, uh, we call it the hotspot. Right. So it makes sense to me too, and it's it's messier than Hawaii, which I know you spent you spent your graduate some of your graduate research there, and you know Hawaii it's very simple. The hot spot is the reason for the magma, and here in Iceland we have sort of these these two components, and it's it's in the Reykjanes area. It's hard to quantify how much of the magmatism is related to the extension and how much is driven by the yeah. hot spot, but they're clearly working together in some capacity. Is that a fair statement? Absolutely, and that's okay. why Iceland is a. Is a uh, um, mountain plateau, really, a big basaltic plateau. Right. That is that is uh, sort of maybe on average somewhere between three thousand and uh, uh, three thousand five hundred to four thousand meters high. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it's east west. It's nine hundred kilometers. North south. It's it's almost five hundred kilometers. Right. And so the total volume of Iceland is equivalent to. The, you know the volume of Deccan traps or the Siberian traps. Right, it's just been spread out over time. Yeah, um, it's, yeah. it's formed over a longer period of time, but it it still is a huge. Yeah, it's a large igneous province. What we'd say in the literature, it's a. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Awesome. So that, but it you know it taking its time to form right. compared to the other ones, which have <laughs> sort of, uh, formed over maybe five hundred thousand years to a million. Yeah, much much years. more rapid. Yeah. So so another question I have is um, there's a lot of. Mm. In the news, there's a narrative now that the Reykjanes Peninsula has, quote unquote, woken up. And I think from a volcanic standpoint, I, I would agree with that. You've had 800 years of quiescence and now six eruptions in four years. So that that, that seems to be the case. Um, but maybe you can speak a little bit about the seismic activity. Because what I tried to do on one of my previous videos is show folks the seismic activity over the last 15 years. And you get these clusters of earthquakes on these different systems without eruptions and these clusters of earthquakes don't necessarily indicate magma movement, magma inflation or ascent. Um, so how do you differentiate those between ma earthquakes happening, you know, for tectonic reasons and earthquakes that are due to magma ascent? You, you tell me. <laughs> right. Well, I was, yeah, like. That, 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 is the hard, that is the hard thing. I mean, I hear seismologists say, yes, we can differentiate between these things. Right. And then you ask them for the specifics, and they say, "Oh, we just know." Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and 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 so it's in some cases, they you know they look at it, uh, they look at a pattern or, or or the behavior, and they they have inferred it in the past that this was due to magma movement. Right. So they kind of correlated. Now, to me, the, these are. Uh, 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 fine as interpretation or, 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 or suggestions or conjecture, but we shouldn't take them too literally. Right, we, I agree. We, we, yeah, we, we we really don't know. And see, the, the Regulus Peninsula has earthquakes between these eruptive periods, and we can have very big earthquakes, mm -hmm. and that's just basically tectonic movement. Right, that's just a movement along the plate boundary, and. Uh, uh, and that is happening all the time, continuously. Right. And then we get these, you know, eruption periods where magma has actually found a way to get to the surface. And we really don't know for sure why and how that happens. But my sort of a feeling for that is that it's related to the regional stress. So you you have these periods where you, the regional stress is actually working 
in such a manner that it closes up things. So there's a bit of maybe a compressive right. force rather than, 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 than extensive. But then you get into the, you know other periods where you have a bit of extension and you open up pathways for the magma. And of course, when you do that, magma moves, uh, starts to occupy some space within the crust and pressurize right. that space. And, and hence help the whole process of getting the magma to the surface. I mean, this is kind of a like, you know, which came first, the chicken yeah. or, or the egg? Yeah, it's, well, the, it's the classic and, problem, exactly the way I explained it, tectonism and volcanism. Are the compressive stresses you talk about related to if you extend one system, then adjacent systems might feel compressive stresses? And so it's a constant game of extension along one tectonic system transferring that stress which becomes compressive it, it, elsewhere it, 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 not really i mean if you look at it on a larger scale then if you look at it on reykjanes peninsula versus interior iceland maybe yes okay but not across the reykjanes peninsula reykjanes peninsula seems to behave more like a single system right even though people talk about many volcanic systems there is no clear definition or yeah, it's you know, lines on a map, really. Is is that's why we we've called them five or six different systems? Is we have these northeast southwest trending. You, you have these lines, but but why do you call one a different system from the other when right. the magma composition is the same and and the fractures overlap? Right, and so yeah, I, I agree. Um, yeah, so there's it, 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 it's not clear how do you differentiate? What is the criteria? Yeah, that we use to differentiate between those systems and. And, and if you talk to a, a geophysicist, he says, well, it's a magma composition. And if you talk to a, a, a petrologist, they say it's a tectonics. <laughs> they blame something else. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Because, yeah, they're, and, they're, and, their field and, and of this study. Is true, this is actually true for the whole of Iceland, even though, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'm not going to say that there are no volcanic systems in Iceland. I think we, we really need to have a closer look at these things and, and, and come up with a way to define them more rigorously. Yeah, I mean, in, you know, in Hawaiian places, it's so much easier because you have these central vent systems, uh, these large edifice, you know, structures. So you can say, yeah. here's Mauna Loa, here's Mauna Kea, here's Kilauea. And even then, there's still some, you know, interaction and there's some connection, you know, deep down, like underneath Pahala and some of those places in Hawaii where there seemed to be a connection before you get to the shallow uh, magma sources. Absolutely. And 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 this it's a it's a it's a all of these are challenges and, and the big difference between Iceland and, and places like Hawaii or Reunion or Galapagos or what which or the ocean island you want to pick is that in Iceland you have the magma storage systems in the crust. Right. And the volcanic edifices sit on the crust. You know, the volcanic edifices in Hawaii they sit on the crust, the oceanic crust in the same way. But the, the the magma storage system is within the volcano, right? Not, it's not in the crust, right? It's higher. Yes. Yeah. And and that, to me, uh, uh, marks a fundamental difference between these two volcanic you know volcanic areas, right? And that, and uh, and it must have a large impact on 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 both the mode of volcanism, frequency, and and how it happens and how things evolve. Right over time. I mean, it, it, people often draw the parallel between the two, but I think we should be more careful with that. I mean, yes, the, the eruptions are sometimes similar, etc., and probably has more to do with the viscosity of the magma than. Right, but the plumbing systems are very different. The settings, tectonically, are even somewhat different, um, mm -hmm. and so the similarities kind of run out there. Yeah. So, what about um, there was early on when this whole series of eruptions and earthquakes began in. October and November, there was speculation from different people, I can't remember who, that the Elverp uh, crater system to the west, that that was a likely eruptive site. And I still kind of keep hearing that in some of the Icelandic news. And obviously there's a set of craters there. I guess my question to you is, um, are recurring eruptions from existing fissure systems, is that something we see historically? If you have an existing set of fractures and fissures, is that pathway likely to be occupied again because you have the spaces? Or does that get sealed up after the last eruption and you're likely to create one, a new one? Really good question. Uh, see, this is what probably surprised most people here is that 
when you know when you have the eruption, they seem to follow existing weaknesses. Mm -hmm. They are reoccupying old volcanic liniments. Right. So the same old volcanic liniments erupt over and over again. Yeah. In some cases, it's basically they erupt up through the the old vents. So and, and, and that is sort of a goes against everything that was, yeah, at least when I was taking geology, it was taught that fissures only erupt once. Mm -hmm. That's not the case at the Reykjavik Peninsula. Right. So there's, they're leaving some, the fracture systems are open enough that they're easy pathways. Sometimes, though, they might get partially solidified, but there's enough of weaknesses in the crust there that they're likely pathways. Is that yes. good? Yes, okay. because most of these, these are along major faults. Right. Probably, you know, uh, uh, lithospheric uh, faults or lithospheric extension. Right. And 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 they're not, you know, just one fr f fracture. They're a zone of deformation and 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 and, and fracturing. So that you know that even if you seal one, there's always number yeah. of others available. And that's why they probably don't erupt exactly in the same place. Uh, and the interesting about Svartsenki, and this is. Uh, some years ago, a colleague of mine, August Guðmundsson, at uh, Royal Holloway uh, College of London, uh, he, he's a structural geologist and has done some modeling. And, and uh, I was talking to him and he said, Svartsengi is a, is a stress trap. Hmm. So for some reason, just the way the stresses are associated, that it seems like when you have something moving, it actually seems to compress and seal off Svartsengi, the area right where Svartsengi is, which is right above where the inflation is taking place. Right. And the magma is coming up on, on the edges of that zone. And, and, and this time around, in, uh, you know, uh, in 2023 and 24, it did that along the Sundnukur lineament, which is on the east side of, 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 the, of the area. And Eldrup is on the... On the west side, yeah. On the west side. So, and, and in the previous eruptive period, it was Eldworth, Benitlarhaun, and, and Arnasetur, that lineament that, that actually erupted. So the Eldworth lineament was active. But the but at that time, the magma body, you think, was under the Svartsengi area, and it fed the magma to the west. Is that correct? So we think it was the we, same. We don't know that for okay. sure, but that, that, that's, that, that, that's the, the suggestion. Right. And the interesting thing, and the reason why we've been mentioning Eldworth, as a possible that they might take over, maybe it is just a, a wishful thinking because then things will move further yeah. away from grid. <laughs> right. Well, it makes sense because it's right there. You have an existing yeah. set of craters. I just was there's, wondering there's, why there's, that one was stressed so yeah, much. The center of the inflation has been seems to be migrating a little bit to the west. Yes, yeah, based on the INSAR data and some of the other yeah. stuff we've seen. Is it? So con that, sorry, go ahead. That's why. I mean, that's why these suggestions have been made. Right. And is it common for um, these you got a magma body underneath Svartsengi, but the magma is escaping, you know, in this case to the east. Um, is there something different about the rocks above it? I kind of speculated that, well, maybe we don't know anything about the composition of those rocks except for the borehole data. But if the basalt is more dense and you may have hyaloclastites, I mean, there's so many different types of rocks with permeability yeah. architectures that for whatever reason it's weaker to the east and that's why the magmas found a pathway there yeah and, and, and well i think also sundukar is on a major boundary which is basically the eastern margin of the of the reykjanes ridge coming on shore mm -hmm. so that that is a major that's a major fault right so you have those already tectonic fractures there yeah and and it's react it's been reactivated over and over and over again right you know, I, I don't know for how long, and definitely all the way through the Holocene, and and the grappings that are in Grindavik, they are very old structures. Mm -hmm. they've, they've been there for a long time, and the reason why Grindavik is there is because of the grappling, because that formed the harbor. The, the harbor, right? The harbor sitting in that downdrop section yeah. of the Graben. Yeah, fascinating. And and Eldworth seemed like you know, if you think of the Reykjanes it coming on shore, Eldworth seemed like they might be in the middle of the of the Rift Valley. Mm. Of the Reykjanes Ridge, right, and and if you go further west and you go towards, you know the the, where the Stampar the ones, on, yeah, right? yeah, Stampar on Reykjanes, and mm -hmm. if you, you, you follow that sort of a inland to the northeast, that that seems like that's the western boundary of that, right, the second coming ashore, and uh, uh, if that is correct, then you know, uh, 
it makes sense that we have these weak zones that would erupt maybe over and over again, especially along the margin, and they would have a lot of small eruptions, just like on the mid-ocean ridges. Right. You might get bigger eruptions closer to the center of the graben. Yeah. Now, why, why the, you know, things are not coming up directly, you know, you're inflating and the swastika, why doesn't it just come straight up? Yeah, a lot of people have that question. Uh, yeah, and, and, and I think you're right. I mean, it, you know, it, it has to do with the, the, the crustal stratigraphy and what kind of rocks you have there. Right. And, most likely, I mean, we don't know because the company doesn't really release this, the stratigraphy. It's a <laughs> yeah secret. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, it's a secret, and uh, so we don't really know the exact stratigraphy uh, uh, beneath the surface at, at Svartsengi. But my gut tells me that there is probably a fairly thick hydroclastite unit there, which is fairly impermeable and probably has sort of a, a viscous properties. So it actually is, is quite strong, mm -hmm. even though it is soft and can deform. Right. It's, it's not breaking as much as the rest. So it's not creating the pathways and the permeability for the magma to work yes. its way through. So that's why the magma comes up along the sides. Right, because you probably have more like subaerial lava flows, stacked flows there that are more brittle and fractured, something different that has more, more yeah, fracturing. Yeah, well, uh, you know, closer to the surface, you got way more lavas and that's where the geothermal reservoir is mm -hmm. but you also have to think about it you know the, the, the pumping magma in not, not a huge amount but reasonable amount of magma, you know 10 million cubic meters in each event uh, between you know four and five kilometers the geothermal system is sort of between two and three maybe one and a half to two and a half kilometers yeah closer to the surface right yes but this magma that's coming in it's not really heating up the geothermal system yeah, it, they're totally, yeah, there's disconnected because it's low permeability in between. Yeah, there must be low permeability in between and, and very mm -hmm. slow heat transfer. Right. From from from, from the magma to, to the geothermal system. But but they apparently had a borehole at Svartsengi that had a gauge that detected elevated temperatures and pressures. Is that just because the yeah. borehole happened to be close to the pathway that the magma took when it moved to the that's, east? That's the, yeah, that's okay. the interpretation. Yeah. So it's sort of fortuitous. And, and it's a very slight, it's a very slight pressure change. Right, so it's nothing that's I mean, predictive. No, I mean, like okay. in Krapla, you know, the, 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 you know, the heat went up, you know, it, it was visible. You could just see more steam. Yeah. And, 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 and the th all the things got more pressurized and they were you know, natural baths there in the region, uh, more than 30 kilometers away, and they become too hot to bathe in, and they remain too hot to bathe in for 30 years. Wow. After the after the event. We're not seeing anything. People are bathing in the yeah. lagoon. <laughs> They're right over the magma body, and like, <laughs> and the temperature is the same. So are there any yeah. plans to drill, either through research with either your university or the, or the geothermal companies, drilling deeper and trying to get some of that subsurface information that might tell us not just the permeability architecture but also our eruptive history on the Reykjanes only goes back about 3,000 years and then yeah. and that's just what the boreholes and the surface data tells us so can we go back further and get more information is there any I'm, ideas I'm, out I'm there? Sure, I'm sure this will come up when things start to slow down a bit. Right you don't want to do it now but right. Yeah no it's just too many things to think about and and you know the the unfortunate thing is that we are in a response mode. Yeah, reactive. Yes, it's just re it, it and and we're just reacting to what's happening and and doing different things and they're doing a fantastic job of that. Right. You know, and and and, and that should should be be celebrated because they they've really kind of done in many ways you know perform miracles in in, in raising these diverting walls in such a short time, etc. But as good as we are in, 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 in reacting, we are equally as bad in preventing. <laughs> right. Mitigation, right? Thinking yes. ahead. <laughs> we need to we need to do a lot more mitigation and, and uh, be pre more better prepared for these things because that would it saves time, it saves money and it reduces risk. And I've heard you champion um, thinking about things this way, like putting in some of these defensive walls around the capital area to the south um, and some of these communities that lie north of these volcanic systems. Ha what's the, 
have public officials really listened? Is there interest or or, are geologists the lone wolf crying on the mountaintop and no one's no one's Uh, listening to us? Well, we we were quite lonely to begin with, but uh, (laughs) they're listening better. uh, Yeah, they're coming around. Okay. And in many cases, we don't need to see. We don't need to raise protective walls right now. But what we need to do is 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 uh, uh, do a proper uh, hazard assessment. So volcanic hazard assessment for for particular right. areas, uh, in order to see where the, you know what are the most likely paths that the lava will go. How much you know will it, if you have this big lava flow, how much will that cover, and then how much threat is that to infrastructure, etc. Right. And if and if we do that, then we and we can do that with with you know the models the lava flow models that we have already, and. Then you can okay start thinking about okay if the lava goes there then you can start to think about what kind of a you know uh, mitigation are you going to take on are you going to put in walls that will divert the flow you know away from this infrastructure and and, and into a, a, a an empty area that you right. know, was not under, under under threat and and then then you can think about okay what kind of a wall do we need to build. And and, where, and what kind of material do we need? To yeah, and how that? high? All those things, yeah. right? All the yeah, specifics. We can, we can plan it completely, right? And if we need to bring in material from other places, then we might, you know, even think about bringing that material in and store it close by, mm-hmm. so we can actually do this fairly quickly when when it's needed. And they, I mean, down in Grindavik, they, they the response time in terms of getting those berms up, it was amazing how quickly they were able to erect those you know nearly 10 meter berms in just a few days ahead of that flow was just i mean i've never seen anything like it people had asked me are there any other maybe you can answer this question are there any other places or communities that have done something like that and i mentioned in hawaii how it's kind of frowned upon in hawaii because there's a cultural component as well but are you aware of any other communities that have kind of rallied against a lava flow in this way and with success not not on this scale and not in this right. time frame. I mean, uh, you know, the Italians have did something like this. Uh, I think it was in nineteen fifties, and they diverted the flow from one town and 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 diverted it to another one. So, right, but it's pretty unprecedented what they what what they yes, were able to is. do these last and, couple but, months. And the the only reason why that that could be done is because all the resources were diverted to it. Yeah. Right, and you had all the equipment that, uh, there, everyone was ready to go. Yeah, yeah, and, and yeah, all the big equipment that exists in the country is there now. Yeah, right. And and, and, and people are working 24-7. And number one, you can't keep that up for, for a very long time. Yeah. You keep that for a period of time. Well, you exhaust people and yeah, it's just, it's not yeah. sustainable. No, and then it's really, really expensive. And also when you're rushed, you bound to make some yeah. mistake in, in some of the decisions that you take and safety so, margins yeah yeah so mitigation is is the key word here and we yeah. need to get better at that and and really really sit down and we need research into this and if, and if we are smart if, if Icelanders are smart yeah not only the government but also the the scientists and, and the, the citizens people, right yeah yeah then you know if we do this right then we can uh, uh, set the protocol for the world. Yeah, you guys become the textbook standard, and then we're like, hey, we'll do what they did, right? Whether it's Canary yeah. Islands or Hawaii, then then we've got some precedents to follow. And yes, I think and then, it, I think a lot of it's land use planning too. Like you you have a lot of growth well, going on near um, Hapnafjord or that area, um, and restricting growth. Or are they looking at that? Like, hey, maybe we don't need to build houses here, but we can still use this for a park or a golf course or something else. Is that? Yeah, they are starting to look at okay. that. They, they resisted, and, and the mayor of Hapnafjord uh, wasn't very happy when I mentioned that and, <laughs> and, and, and used some uh, colorful language. Yeah. <laughs> well, word to, to, yeah. to refer to to uh, to this volcanologist that was. Talking about. <laughs> Well, we've, we've, you need to do it. And if you if you look, we we've done. Uh, uh, so we have sort of a two types of models. One of our models is it, it basically it's a it's a, a statistical one. So and the probability, so we get information about where the lava is most likely to flow. Right. So we need good Not modeling really, surveys. Right. 
Yeah, and it's, it's not to say how you know where the lava goes, or how big it is going to be. It's just what is the most likely path it will flow down. If, right. If we have an eruption here, it will go over there. Right. Even though it doesn't always follow that, just path of easiest descent. Yes. That, yeah. And it's it, yeah, it basically is because we do this, we recognize areas where you have you know most likely eruption sites, and then we let you know we make some eruption sites within that area, we let it erupt, each one of them erupt like 1,700 times, and then you just see where the lava will flow, and, and, right. and then you get you get a good statistics on, on, on your probability. And when we did that for the area of, of Vettlid, above Vettlid in Hapnafjörður, the main paths are actually through the neighborhood. Yeah. You've already got infrastructure in, in the way, like right in the path of where it's likely to go. Yeah. And so... I mean, it would have been if they would have made the, these kind of simulation before they designed the the neighborhood. It would have been clear to them. It would be much uh, better to have all the apartment and, and houses on higher ground. In, yes, where they have the industrial <laughs> section. <Yeah. on. laughs> right. It's actually you know it's, they, they did so, it backwards, kind of in a way. Yeah. Yeah, because you want the homes and the the residences to be in the safest place, and then there's place things you can use in the more risky areas that are still usable, whether it's a park or a golf course or, like you said, maybe an industrial area. Um, yeah, you know, a workplace or or, or, or recreation. Mm -hmm. You know, and that, and, and uh, I mean, that's been done a number of places uh, in in the world. I mean, one of the great examples of that is, of course, Portland. Mm -hmm. Because yeah, they, you know, they, and that's just the flood. So they have the, their recreation areas in, in the on the flood plain. There's no houses. Yeah, it's parks and and uh, green belts, what they call, yeah. and um, just you know pathways and it's recreation. But you keep the shopping centers, the schools, the churches, the homes uh, out of harm's way. So yeah. well, hopefully they'll look towards that moving forward. And you know, it's I I, I, I really hope so because it, it, you know it makes much sense to do it, and and if. Grindheim, for example, would have done it. They would have developed the town to the east. Right. You can still have the harbor there, but let's have everyone yeah. live like, you know, a kilometer away. Yeah. Um, like so. just as you're heading up that grade that, that way. So interesting. Well, I just have maybe another question or so. I know I uh, appreciate your time today. Um, maybe to kind of wrap up, what do you... What do you think the most common public misconception about volcanism in Iceland is? Like maybe... The, the thing you correct the most when you when you're talking to the public about Iceland volcanism uh, I think there, there are probably two things one is related to well I should probably say three things one is related to uh, uh, and, and everyone thinks Eyjafjallajökull produced enormous amount of ash and right and, and reality is it didn't <laughs> yeah it was ice yeah, and, and it was was much less acid, and and it was actually a really weak eruption. It's not a big explosive eruption. It's not a powerful explosive right. eruption at all. And but it and the closing of the of the airspace had much more to do with rules and regulations of of, of yeah. the time than it had to do with the amount of ash in the air. Yeah, the impact was greater than the event, more or less. Yes. Yeah. I agree. And 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 so that so you quite often have to correct correct that because it. And the likelihood of getting another air like you could eruption in Iceland in our lifetime is, is probably pretty slim anyway. Well, and you're losing the ice, and I mean, there's all sorts of factors at play there. Yeah. The, the glaciers are shrinking, and yeah. and the other thing is, uh, a lot of people think that it, because if you have basaltic eruptions erupting through ice, that they become more explosive. Mm -hmm. That's that's also a misconception. Right, because it would start out with the pillow lavas at the bottom, generally. Yeah, no, but, but, but the explosive activity has more to do with absolution of magmatic acids, and mm. this is what we demonstrated in our research, than it has to do with the the uh, interaction with external water. What the the effect of, of the external water is, is actually to reduce the grain size of the ejected material. Oh, okay. So it produces more ash, and because us is smaller, you can disperse it further right. in, the, in the atmosphere, it, but it does not increase the intensity of the eruption. Hmm, interesting. I didn't know that. Did you see yeah. on this last eruption on the 8th of February, when this was you know a few hours into the eruption, there was that you know, water vapor plume and ash, and I was actually live streaming at the time, and so I was watching it on the webcams and was 
making up the geology as I went, but I speculated it was groundwater that was that was interacting with the lava. But we probably had at that point less lava in the system and enough groundwater to produce that. Would you agree with that, or is there it, something it, else? It, 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 towards the end, you have water come in and generating steam. Okay. But initially, it has nothing had nothing to do with groundwater or. Uh, what happened is that you know the central portion of that fissure stopped erupting, so the magma drained down, and and only the the north and the south ends of it remained active. Right. And we've seen this before, both in Caldicatal eruption and and a few of the others. And what started to happen then is the walls, because the magma had drained down, the walls of the conduit become unstable and start to collapse in. Hmm. And that collapse generate dust basically oh. lava and that's okay. and it's it, it's a hot environment so you get these convective plumes come up really dark gray and it's basically just dust so it's more so collapse coming. more collapse in debris and and yep. maybe a tiny bit but or maybe none in terms of lava water interaction in the yeah, subsurface what, what i think happened in this case is that you know the collapse was substantial enough that it opened up uh, you know groundwater pathway mm. Whether that was a crack or a, a lava tube, I don't know. Right. So the water got into the hot environment and it generated the steam. Okay. Yeah, the be, steam activity was very passive. Yeah, are they planning to go in there? It'd be interesting to see if that event widened out the fissure and the fractures maybe now you know, 10 meters wide or something like that. Has there been any aerial surveys or someone that's gone and looked to see what not, that landform not, looks like? Not in detail. We, okay. we might try to prove that next week, but not not in in great detail. That would be interesting. I mean, we, had, we, we had similar events happening in Vent Five in Caldicatal eruption on second of July in twenty one. Okay, right. So yeah. you've had precedent for it. Yeah. So these things that seem to seem to happen, and are, are more common than we thought. And it's a very interesting thing because mm -hmm. that it, you know it's. It's a it's a totally new kind of a view of of, of this activity, you know, that you can right. actually generate, uh, uh, you know, reasonably intense. Conduct. Yeah, it, it looked it impressive, does, and if you were standing yeah, next yeah. to it, it would have been hazardous. But it's oh, yeah, but it's always when it's waning. It sounds like during as the yeah. fissure system and the fire fountains are kind of dying down and waning. That's when you tend to see it if you see it at all. Yes. Okay. Interesting. Well, last real quick question here, and I'll let you go, and I appreciate your time. Um, obviously, the influx of magma and how how sustainable this is is the big key factor, but how do you see the rest of this year playing out? Now, I hate these questions, too, because no one knows, um, but if the if magma influx is constant, I mean, what are your what are your thoughts just moving forward? Uh, at the moment, it seems like we have a sort of a semi-stable configuration of, of things, and so we have this inflow of magma from a, from a deeper storage zone, and that's pretty sort of a constant. You know, it it, it doesn't seem to change much. I mean, the fluctuations in that are, are maybe from one one to two millimeters per, per uh, uh, sorry rise rate fluctuating by one or two millimeters per second or something like that. Mm -hmm. that's, but it's fairly you know, constant, right? yeah. Yeah, and. So it's not, you know, as long as you maintain that and you have the stability, then I think we're going to have this rhythm. And you think and it'll be in more or less the same area, or is it likely I, to, to broaden over that, time? I think it's, it, it's most likely to take place in the same area for the ne you know, next few months at least. Right. Unless the, the inflation centers start to migrate, you know, preferentially kind of yeah the, uh, to, to the west and then i think you know we just repeat this you know eruptions every three four weeks yeah it's crazy and, how and, like cyclical it was if this yeah. first three just clockwork but, almost yeah but the minute you cut on you know the supply however you do it if you get if we get a big earthquake on the plate boundary we mm -hmm. might collapse the, the conduit and then we might have a right topic different ball game on our hands because each eruption <clears throat> and each seismic events especially the bigger ones change the permeability and fracture system they change the pressure and the stress conditions and so even though it seems like it's the same thing playing out there's these small factors that could change the course of things over time yes yeah uh, and so 
I think we should just sit back and watch and enjoy it while it while it keeps doing its kind of in a rhythmic fashion and hope that it doesn't cause too much damage. Yeah. And uh, but at some point it will change. Yeah. Well, it will, it, it will move to another place. Yeah. And who knows? I mean, it'll be interesting to see if they if it, as it becomes more regular and less. I don't want to say hazardous, but more. Um, well, more regular and like it's just something that's happening all the time. Will they allow p public to go in and kind of watch this if it's not in a hazardous zone? That'll be interesting to see how that plays out. It will be. I mean, I don't know what they're going to do, but I expect they will. Yeah. If, you know, the, the more comfortable they get, the, the more they see this as an acceptable risk. Mm -hmm. Just like now they see it as an acceptable risk to go into Grindavik and work in Grindavik. Mm-hmm. With the, 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 the caveat that certain areas are, are fenced off with where the main fractures are and things like that. Right. Um, but people get more comfortable with the whole thing and more relaxed things are going to get. Yeah. Well, hopefully that's the case. I'll, I'll be out there in May, so hopefully we'll be able to see something. So. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm sure they will. I mean, the, the, minute, the minute they can let people in, I think they will. Yeah, and I, I've always appreciated that about the Icelandic community. They, they realize it's a, a spectacle of nature, and it's there for people to enjoy. It's a very different environment than like 2018 when I was in Hawaii. Like everything, you, you couldn't get anywhere near that Lower East Rift yeah, Zone. Know, it yeah. was, yeah. I mean, a lot of us have the philosophy, and definitely I have the philosophy that I mean, I don't like banning and, and, and telling people what to do. Right. But I like to inform them about, you know, what yeah. are the potential danger, what could be the consequences of certain actions, and then they're informed. Yeah, let them make their own choice. There, there's hot lava, be smart, <laughs> right? Yeah, like, that's exactly. kind of the idea. So, well, thanks so much, uh, Professor Thorlerson. It was awesome for you to join us here today. I hope you'll consider doing it again. I learned a lot from you as well, and I know the viewers will just find this really, really uh, enjoyable. My pleasure, and yeah, absolutely. Okay. Let's find a time in the, in the near future to do it again. Yes, awesome. Thanks so much. I appreciate the time today. Best of luck, and have a great okay. weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.